Well, welcome everyone. Good evening. Great to see you all here. Um, welcome to the Crawford School where we do research and applied research and reach into policy and uh, teach all of these things in our masters and PhD programs and where we have wonderful visitors who uh, come and, and share their insights with us um, every so often. My name is Frank Jotzo. I run the Center for Climate Economics and Policy here at Crawford School. Um, this is a joint event with the ANU Climate Change Institute and Professor Mark Howden is here uh, tonight as well to jointly host that with us. So let's start by acknowledging and celebrating first Australians on whose land lands uh, we meet, paying our respects to the elders uh, of the Ngunnawal people. Um, so very delighted to have uh, Howard Bamsey here tonight to give a public lecture on climate change finance, um, the Green Climate Fund, um, and, uh, and the imperative for transformation, I think you called it, um, Howard. Uh, so Howard's talk will be followed by uh, short remarks from Australia's current uh, Ambassador for Environment, uh, Mr. Patrick Suckling, um, who will set out, I think, uh, a perspective from the Australian government on climate change finance. And then we will have plenty of time for question and answer and discussion. I very much look forward to that. Um, so Howard Bamsey, many of you know him or know of him. Nevertheless, though, he's Executive Director of the Global Green Climate Fund, which is the UN principal body um, for providing funding for climate change action uh, in developing countries. So uh, Howard has a long and distinguished career in the Australian Public Service. Uh, he was Deputy Secretary, Department of Environment, I think it might have been called at that time. Um, he was Australia's uh, chief climate diplomat as ambassador uh, for environment uh, and also as special envoy on climate change later on. Uh, he was also Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute uh, in Seoul. Um, and he's, of course, a very good friend of ANU. Um, in fact, he was uh, honorary professor here at ANU uh, just before uh, he went to, to Songdo to head up the Green Climate Fund. So without further ado, uh, please well, make welcome Howard Bamsey. Thanks very much uh, indeed. Frank, and good evening, everybody. Um, it's, it's really good to be back here. I, I fear, though, that maybe I've misled you a little uh, and that some of you will be expecting uh, a story about the whole of climate finance, uh, and, and I really don't have that story to tell because, as Frank explained, the Green Climate Fund is exclusively focused on developing countries. So that means the story I have to tell really is a development story. And that's, I guess, if there's one point I want to be really clear about, it is that climate action and development these days are more closely aligned than most people outside the, the sphere really imagine. And there are good reasons for that, which we might discuss. It's also a story of uh, the $100 billion commitment, which I think is a headline that many people are familiar with, uh, that in 2009, initially, the developed world pledged itself to mobilise $100 billion a year from all sources uh, by 2020 for climate action in the developing world. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the role of the Green Climate Fund in that mobilisation task. Please uh, feel free if you think I'm becoming too obscure or I say something especially contentious to interrupt. Just, just inter introduce yourself so that we all know uh, who we're dealing with and interrupt at any stage uh, to make a point or for clarification. Uh, I know this is not, uh, this is not the way um, lectures normally um, proceed in the Crawford School, but um, Let's try to make it a discussion from the beginning. And from the beginning, I guess, in the climate change, international climate change picture, now, uh, now means from the time of the Paris Agreement, it was a new beginning. But in terms of explaining the story of climate finance and the 100 billion, we have to just focus for a second on the fact that Paris was also uh, a conclusion 
to about 20 years of extremely difficult negotiations about the climate challenge in which the framing was how developed countries would share the burden of uh, dealing with climate change because it was the developed countries that had caused the problem uh, and it was therefore their moral uh, obligation to solve it. But at Paris, we saw uh, uh, the transition from that framing of the problem as exclusively uh, one for developed countries to solve to a new one in which all countries saw it as in their interest to take climate action. And when I say all countries, I mean all but one or two. Uh, and since then, even one of those uh, has joined the Paris Agreement. And it was, it was the $100 billion pledge which was the vehicle for that transition. Because for 20 years, uh, developed countries and developing countries had a standoff about how to solve the ethical dilemma uh, about um, the responsibility for climate change and, uh, and who should solve it. And at Copenhagen, a much derided meeting uh, in 2009, uh, effectively the deal was done that, uh, that developed countries committed to, uh, provide, to mobilise $100 billion a year by 2020. Now, for, for language experts, uh, there are probably many ways you can talk about mobilise. Uh, and since it was a, was a word that created to enable an agreement in the UNFCCC, it can mean whatever um, different people thought it meant at the time. Um, and we can go into that in discussion, I think, because it is worth, it is worth coming to some conclusions about whether that $100 billion is likely to be available and mobilised by 2020. And here's a spoiler, I think it is, but it's going to be very difficult to prove it. By the way, the, the transition was also enabled from the, the old days where there was a standoff over who should do what and basically not much happened to the new days of universal action on climate change as a result of Paris. The, apart from the $100 billion pledge, which enabled universal, universal action, the, the other element that I think was particularly important was the, um, the adoption of what were called nationally determined contributions, which every country brought along to Paris what it was prepared to do. And just to say that um, Australia can really claim ownership of that concept because it was uh, an idea called something else, called schedules, that Australia had proposed a few years before. And uh, it hadn't worked then, but the idea had stuck and eventually became one of the elements that I think led to success in Paris. The objective financially uh, after Paris be be became one in which the task was to use the public funds available to mobilise um, additional funding. And where was that going to come from? Well, it had to come from private investors. I'm trying to avoid using the term the private sector because I don't really know what that means, but it's people who make their own decisions about where they're going to invest. And the idea uh, in, it, so far as the Green Climate Fund was concerned after Paris was that the public resources, which would be, had been pledged uh, and would be committed to the Green Climate Fund should be used as one of the vectors for mobilising that $100 billion a year that the uh, that the developed countries had committed to. Now, there was a misunderstanding here which becomes important for the politics of climate change to follow because uh, 
for some countries, most of them developing countries, the idea was that developed countries would provide $100 billion a year of public funds. For developed countries, that was never the case. Their, their explicit commitment at the time was to mobilise the funding from different sources. And for us in the Green Climate Fund, that misunderstanding often means we're expected to have $100 billion a year uh, that we're ploughing through and providing to developing countries. And we're a long way from that. We're at about $2.5 billion a year at the moment. Our, our role, to go back for a second, our role therefore was to use these public resources to transform the investment climate, to make it fundamentally different around the world so that what had not been attractive uh, for investment previously on the climate front would become attractive in the future. And there was broad consensus that uh, this sort of transformation was possible. Uh, and I think, well, the G19 tells the story because there was one member of the G20 that wasn't convinced that it was needed last year. But um, the, by and large, for, for most of the time since Paris, uh, there's been agreement by most of the actors that the transformation from uh, business as usual to what in our jargon we call low carbon climate resilient future is absolutely essential and it underpins development, getting back to this story as a story of development. And the results have been pretty marked, I think. We've seen a range of different activities taking place uh, and different trends emerging, which are, I think, to some extent, a result not just of the Paris Agreement, but of the whole context of the Paris meeting. I think it's possible that at least as important as the formal agreement between 190 countries was the work that uh, the UN Secretary General at the time, Ban Ki-moon and others put into what's now called the Climate Action Agenda, which is, which is extending, evangelising, bringing into the climate action network, if you like, not just the, the uh, community groups uh, and civil society, but real hard-headed business people who are beginning to better understand the importance and the opportunity that climate action offers. So all of these things began to change, slowly change the investment climate. And there have been a number of trends, specific trends coming from these, uh, the, these um, motivations, I guess, um, that are worth looking at in detail. I won't look at them in detail, but just quickly mention them because most of you will be familiar with most of them. And people at ANU um, will probably uh, have had their eye on divestment trends for at least a couple of years. Uh, and it's still small, uh, as you can see, but the direction is unmistakable. Um, and, and, and what it's about, you know, is, is essentially people moving their money out of fossil fuels. And we're seeing some big decisions beginning to emerge with uh, London and New York, uh, the two chief financial centres, no coincidence, uh, moving their, um, their, their uh, long-term investments uh, out of uh, fossil fuels. We've seen other universities than ANU take the same direction. Stanford recently. Foundations such as Rockefeller have moved that way. And the big question at the moment is whether Norway's sovereign wealth fund will swing all the way or stay sort of halfway. Uh, I think that's a really crucial move. Uh, 
because the key to whether this divestment um, is economically significant is scale. Uh, and at a certain point, it seems to me that what at the moment may well be in many cases ethical motivation will have to move to just mainstream economic decision making because uh, it will be clear that that pathway is economically likely to be more successful than business as usual. So I said I wasn't going to say much about these, so I'll move on quickly. Um, the renewable story, everybody in this room will know very well. The only point to make here, I think, is that um, this and, and this and divestment probably isn't in this category yet, but this is one of the trends that's moved from the developed world to the developing world and can now, and, and can now be, be seen as universal. Some of the cheapest renewables being deployed at the moment are in the developing world. Uh, places like India, Brazil, uh, the Gulf states, Morocco, uh, other parts of, uh, of Africa are now seeing really extraordinarily uh, cheap um, solar, mainly solar and mainly PV still at this stage uh, deployed. I hope we can have a bit more discussion about this, but we're getting to um, a point where uh, in most, certainly in, in off-grid situations, but even in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in most parts of the world, uh, when we're talking about electricity available through grids, uh, renewable, renewables are competitive with any other source and cheaper usually, and there are people in the room who know the story better than I, so I won't uh, spend any longer on it. But as, a, as someone who was in the Australian Greenhouse Office um, a long time ago and looking at, I don't know, how much, Chris, was, did we think uh, solar was then? It was sort of at one point 80 cents a kilowatt hour. It's now two cents a kilowatt hour in the latest uh, auctions. It's just ridiculous, really. Another trend which um, is moving from the developed world where it began uh, to the developing world uh, is green bonds issuance. A lot of people are not so keen about this because they're worried about standards, but I think that challenge is being met and we have really exponential expansion of, uh, uh, of green bonds issuance. Uh, and I, I was in a meeting last year of the Climate Bonds Initiative. Um, I don't know if you know CBI, Climate Bonds Initiative. It's a London-based organisation led by a quite extraordinary Australian called Sean Kidney. Uh, you'll hear that name if you haven't already. Uh, and he predicted last year that by certainly the mid-20s, 2025, but probably before, uh, green bonds issuance would be a trillion dollars. Uh, everybody laughed at the time. A year later, we are all taking this really seriously because the, this, this market continues to expand. As I said, standards have been an issue, are still an issue, but um, are being solved. And I think to divert a bit, but someone might be interested, I think that the green bonds experience, uh, and we're now seeing, um, as I said, we're now seeing that move well and truly in the developing world, uh, that that could be uh, very useful for Islamic finance, where, uh, again, lack of standards uh, is one of the problems bedeviling uh, sukuk issuance. And I think green bonds experts uh, could, could be very usefully, uh, could provide very useful input to uh, the providers of Islamic finance. There are a few reasons that I think uh, we're seeing these changes. Uh, and one of them is that, you know, is just the proliferation of climate change law around the world. Um, this is sometimes exaggerated. I think uh, Australia has probably um, uh, 
played a misleading role here because every time there's a change of government here, we change all of our climate change laws, dump that one. And so we, our average must be very high, I think, uh, globally. Um, the, this, this is interesting case because uh, in some cases, the developing countries led in climate change law. It's just worth noting this, uh, lest we think that the pattern is always something starts in the developed world and moves. Countries like Costa Rica, South Africa and China uh, were really pioneers of some parts of climate change law uh, and they maintain a leadership role. In the developing world, climate change law is focused more on resilience, on adaptation than on mitigation. Uh, that, that if you read the NDCs from cover to cover, and I wouldn't recommend it, uh, you will see that uh, adaptation is, uh, is by far the more important issue for developing countries. And that's reflected in their climate change law. Well, if I've been sounding positive all, with all these trends, then this IEA slide uh, will give you a cold shower. That's a very common treatment from the IEA, I found. Um, they're, they're really saying that uh, all of the technologies we need, with a few exceptions, need a lot more work yet if we're going to make the two degrees um, objective. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. We all know we need a lot more work. So if, uh, if, we, if we think about why and how, uh, then we come back to the question of finance, I think, because uh, the development of established technologies and their deployment is often tripped up by lack of finance, and I'll tell some of that story soon, because I know there are people here and good friends of mine who wonder what on earth, uh, why on earth we're bothering with uh, talking about even the issue of climate finance when it could all be fixed very easily with a good carbon market. Uh, and I haven't mentioned that. This, that's the first time I've mentioned um, that term. Uh, and one day there will be, I'm sure, uh, a carbon market which which affects the change in, in investment that all of these uh, efforts that I'm talking about now would otherwise do and do it more efficiently perhaps, but it isn't there yet. So we're still in a situation where um, we, have to, we have to make, provide concessional finance uh, carefully calibrated in order to get things moving. And in this context of the IEA's complaint that we need a lot more effort on technologies, uh, we're uh, mandated this year in the Green Climate Fund to uh, provide a, to offer um, a request for uh, proposals on technology incubators and accelerators. Uh, I don't know how much that will be worth. Our last one was $500 million, but I think this one will be be much smaller, but we're still working on it. This is just a quick overall picture at, uh, uh, from, from the Climate Policy Initiative, who are the gurus on climate finance. Uh, this is a, a picture of the, the, the global story in the last couple of years, uh, with, with uh, last year's numbers still to come. The, the apparent reversal in 2016 was, I think, will be seen as not that in the future. It was really just um, following a peak year in 2015 with investments in China and uh, India. The interesting thing about this graph, of course, is the, is the contrast between the green, which is public sources, uh, and the red, uh, private sources of, uh, of climate finance. So this is now an expanding area. It's becoming quite substantial. Things are happening. The finance for climate action doesn't always reach the most vulnerable, however. Um, and most of the investments are in mitigation. Uh, and, and we need to do much more on adaptation because uh, 
we now know a lot more than we did even a few years ago about the impacts of climate change that are with us and adaptation is uh, going to be more and more important in the future, especially for the most vulnerable. Uh, this is uh, an interesting picture of uh, what happens even when we spend a lot on adaptation. There are still the red spots and the brown spots are still uh, people with great vulnerability to climate impacts. So not only do we have a lot more work to do on technology, we have a lot more work to do on the vulnerable and removing that vulnerability. For developing countries, climate action is very important, but when they get out of bed in the morning, leaders of developing countries don't think immediately about climate change. What they think about immediately is development. Uh, and what's happening as a result of Paris is that that development imperative is increasingly being aligned with the climate change objectives that those leaders and their predecessors uh, have set for their countries. As I said earlier, this has been enabled by a reframing of the climate challenge from simply burden sharing among developed countries to opportunity sharing uh, between developed and, and developing. And for not just, a, it's not just because of the framing of the argument, it's because we have a real world understanding now that great opportunity does come from climate action, can come from climate action. I think if you want, in my opinion, one of the clearest cases of this, it's China where at a relatively early stage, no matter what they said in the UN process, where they had a completely different approach, domestically, China long ago saw the need for climate action and took it. And I think that's got a lot to do with uh, the way their government runs. And by that, I don't mean the usual thing. I mean that they've got a lot of engineers in the government and they saw a problem all the presidents that I can remember, for example, have been engineers. And they saw a problem and it had to be fixed. Uh, in Australia, you know, the government's full of economists and lawyers. Um, no comment <laughs> is needed, I think. So uh, this, this picture shows that, um, uh, you know, it shows Paris and the SDGs all lined up together. And, and I think, um, where that takes us is, uh, is a much greater likelihood of climate action seen as development action because developing countries generally are beginning, I think, to uh, sign on um, to the idea of sustainable development as expressed in the sustainable development goals and putting their climate action into that context uh, very clearly. So, enter the Green Climate Fund. Um, we we uh, came along before Paris. Um, we came as part of the $100 billion pledge. We were the institutional part of the $100 billion pledge established to, um, to provide some of that funding from the developed world to the developing world. Now, Frank mentioned my uh, previous roles uh, in government and in 2009, I was one of those people arguing against the establishment of a new climate fund. I thought um, I, I had, uh, I don't know what I've done here. Um, I thought um, there was no need for another fund. That was the last thing the world needed. We should just provide the funding. We certainly needed the funding, provide the funding to existing banks and other international financial institutions. But what happened, because there were a lot of people making the same argument, was that the characteristics of the other agencies were not those that most developing countries wanted to rely on for climate finance. Now, I'm not pointing any fingers, but, but there was a feeling that then, that as a result of the governance arrangements from Bretton Woods uh, and other international agencies, developing countries uh, 
didn't have sufficient say in how the available funding was being used. So the GCF was created in order to respond to those needs for more developing country involvement. And the result is that we are genuinely a different sort of fund. It doesn't always please the others that we're different, but that's the way things are. We are much more country driven, authentically, genuinely country driven. That is, we, we do what countries want. We don't go to countries and say, we think this is a great idea and you should do it and here's how. We ask them to come up with the ideas. We, we genuinely do that uh, and try to do it every day. Uh, it's very keenly felt. Of course, we are focused entirely on climate change. Uh, so we are the world's largest dedicated climate fund. And that's a different, different perspective too from other financial institutions. We are not interested ourselves in doing, just let, if I can just finish the, question, the, the sentence, in doing business as usual. We love to see, uh, that is, installing renewables where they're commercially sensible and, uh, uh, and, and um, taking um, other climate action that's uh, just part of the, the scene these days. We love to see that happening, but our mandate is transformative action. So we try to ensure that every dollar we spend has not just the impact that it's intended to in its project, but has a further impact of transformation of uh, being able to uh, be replicated or change a system fundamentally and irreversibly. That's that point. Over to you. And just for context, if you can just let us know who you are for the benefit of the rest of the audience. Tom Worthington from the Research School of Computer Science. I've just marked nine assignments on sustainability this morning. And I guess I'd like to ask you the same question I commented on the students. Can you give an example of a specific thing the fund's done yep. and what it's achieved in terms of reduction in carbon emissions or yeah. improvement of life or mitigation or something? I, I, look, it's, I, all, I, it's all a bit abstract yeah, at the moment. Yeah, I agree, Tom. And look, I promise everyone else this, this wasn't a plant. Uh, he, he's, really, he's really fed up with my being abstract. I am getting to the specifics in a, in a second. Uh, it, I'll, I'll even have some pictures of how people's lives are changing uh, because we are. But I'm just defining at this stage why. And the reason is we are a different sort of fund. Uh, and um, we can use, most international financial institutions have restrictions on the sort of instruments they can use. They can do loans or they can do um, grants. We can do those and we can do equity and guarantees and anything you can think of. Uh, in fact, if anyone can think of something that would work that no one's tried yet, we'd be glad to see it. And finally, we have deliberately adopted a risk appetite that's uh, higher, more extensive than the multilateral banks. Uh, just quickly, one more abstract point, um, if I may, um, before we get to the results. And that is that uh, finance is key in climate action, but it isn't enough. Uh, and we need a lot of policy work of two different sorts. One, regulation to create uh, an investment climate uh, which just provides the right incentives for investment in climate friendly activity rather than climate unfriendly activity. Uh, and secondly, we need policy work that integrates the, and this is crucial in the developing world, that integrates the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, the climate action agenda, uh, that integrates that into broader economic planning that engages the finance ministries and the cabinets of developing countries. And the GCF is helping countries do that sort of work. So, what have been the results then? What are the sort of things we do? Well, we're now a financing partner for 79 countries. Actually, I think that's just increased. Uh, our board has approved almost $4 billion worth of large projects. We are, even though this approvals process began just over two years ago, we are implementing um, 
actually that number's out of date. It's now $1.2 billion worth of the 3.7 that's been approved. So we're implementing um, those projects. And you can see a couple of other examples of things that are being done uh, in terms of uh, projects being approved. We have a, 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 pi a pipeline stimulant, which is a design of different stages of support for countries. So we start it with something called readiness, where we help them build their institutions, uh, get their ideas in line, develop whole of government positions. That moves to project concepts, which then are brought through uh, accredited entities, we call them. That's jargon. That means organisations that want to do the projects. Uh, we pr can provide project um, um, development assistance. And then finally, we get high quality projects. And here are a few examples of the projects that we've, we've begun work on. Uh, one of the really key issues, and here we're getting to how it affects people's lives, Tom. One of the really key issues in developing countries is that many of them don't have any idea about their climate baseline. They don't know what stage of change uh, their climate is in and what's going to happen in the future. Now, the data are available, by and large, uh, through the World Meteorological Association organisation, but they're not that many developing countries don't have the climate information systems to deliver that data to them and to make it useful to their tourist industry or their their uh, agricultural industry. And so we've got a project um, that began um, back here at readiness and went right through uh, to uh, a fully fledged project quite quickly. We've got a project in Vanuatu which will help apply the data in a useful manner for industrial use uh, in not just Vanuatu, but in uh, the, the region, so that uh, you will see investments that can be made with more uh, confidence in, say, tourism or agriculture, because people will know uh, how the climate impacts, climate change impacts are likely to be felt. And we're doing um, similar things in the Caribbean. Uh, as a result of last year's hurricanes, the Caribbean countries have established, um, with uh, help from a lot of people, have established a, uh, a climate smart zone, $8 billion of investment being put forward. Um, we're part of the response to that um, through um, providing a whole range of different factors of resilience, but essentially um, a lot of interest in uh, more resilient power and water systems, which are usually the first casualties of uh, hurricanes. In fact, the immediate problem after most hurricanes anywhere is potable water, uh, because all the water systems go down. So that's really where we're providing a focus in the Caribbean at the moment. One of the things we try to do with the countries we work with, which is a bit different from some institutions, but in many ways very similar to what the multilateral banks do, is to develop strategies. Uh, and the difference is that we don't do them ourselves. We ask and support countries to do their own. We call them country programs, pretty obvious word takes a hell of a lot of effort, though, to translate what is in, for most countries, pretty vague commitments in the NDCs into real project proposals uh, in a coherent country program. And in Zambia, we've managed to do that. And as a result, uh, they've had a series of approvals for projects uh, in quite different sectors. Um, for example, in, uh, in providing renewable energy, uh, and in agriculture. What that is witness to is that if countries are clear about where they're going, uh, then we're able to help them more readily. If you read NDC's cover to cover, which, as I said earlier, I wouldn't recommend, you'll see that um, 
the land sector looms very large for most developing countries, uh, and in particular, livelihoods in agriculture. That is, in fact, the number one, if you read developing, developing country indices, it's the number one priority they have. And in that picture, smallholders are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So in a number of different countries, we're doing a range of different things to uh, change the picture for uh, smallholders and agriculture generally. In some cases, we're doing something that's pretty obvious, which is um, helping move helping farmers move to climate resilient crops. For example, in Morocco, argan um, orchards are being developed. Uh, this has another function too because it, and it's, it's a theme in our work in the land sector, it's moving tradition to a commercial basis because uh, argan fruit were traditionally co collected from natural forest uh, and uh, there was a fair bit of disturbance involved in that with roads and so on. Uh, we've now helped uh, people in different part, two different parts of Morocco to establish plantations for argon and to help preserve the natural forest. Uh, sometimes, actually, it's finance itself which can be, uh, which can make a real change. And we work with um, a, a New York-based not-for-profit company called Acumen, uh, we have two different projects from them. I think they're both wonderful projects. The one in agriculture is in uh, Africa. And what it's, what it's intended to do is shift the pattern of, of investment in adaptation from grants to go out and do something, you, you know, people, poor people need grants, to build a market so that um, there will be long-term capital available to entrepreneurs to change the pattern of agriculture. This is, I think, a very exciting and very prospective um, result. So is, and this is, I won't mention, I won't speak about this too long because, again, it's, a, it's not an uncommon approach to, uh, to moving private capital into renewables uh, you just remove some of the risk and some of the obstacles initially with some concessional financing. We've done that very effectively, I think, with partners such as the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in Egypt uh, to, uh, to really change the picture there for private investment and to help Egypt meet its renewable target of 20% generation by 2022, which is a pretty astonishing feat for Egypt. We've helped them do the regulatory work too uh, that I mentioned earlier as being crucial if you really want to uh, see private investment flourish. Uh, final, finally, my favourite topic, energy efficiency. I won't go into the detail, but we have different energy efficiency projects in a number of different countries trying to fill the gap that the IEA keeps saying is the number one gap uh, for the future. And again, we've, we're doing all sorts of, uh, we're taking all sorts of different approaches with our partners here uh, to change the picture of finance for energy efficiency, which is usually uh, the biggest single problem. Uh, Energy access is still an enormous problem. Uh, that is, many people have no access to electricity at all. And this is another example here of uh, innovation from the Acumen Fund, one of our partners that I mentioned earlier in agriculture. They have effectively created uh, a market that didn't exist before, using some of our funding and other people's funding to provide equity for entrepreneurs uh, in, the, um, in the renewables business uh, in East Africa. And so we now have a whole new class of entrepreneurs in East Africa and a whole new industry, uh, which, by the way, places particular emphasis on, um, on women and training women for tasks which uh, they had been excluded from previously. That emphasis on, uh, on gender 
is a characteristic, I think, of the GCF that most people see as uh, quite striking. Got a long way to go. We've made, I think, a reasonable start uh, in a fairly short time from when the fund became operational at the end of 2015, thanks in large part to the efforts of Ewan MacDonald, who from DFAT was, I think, is now the longest serving chair of the board of uh, the GCF. He spent three years in that unenviable role uh, and uh, made a very important difference to uh, the, the success of the GCF. But we've still got a lot of problems um, and a lot of, uh, lot of challenges in front of us. One thing, for example, I mentioned just one from this list which puzzles me is why the private sector, to use that term, uh, isn't more interested in adaptation. There is a, there's a huge number of profitable projects that are available, but, but somehow private investors uh, uh, find it easier to invest in mitigation, in renewables in particular, than in adaptation. Where water, you know, it cries out for uh, investment uh, and all sorts of ways to do it profitably. This is, a, this is a, a, an important moment for the GCF because the good news is that we're running out of our funding. We have a lot of cash, but of the, of the, the bankable pledges we received uh, a few years ago, we're now approaching the point at which uh, if the current pace of approvals continues, we will exhaust our funding end of this year, at latest early next year. That's a very good thing because it means we're seeing lots of transformational activity in the climate sphere in the developing world. And it's a great opportunity for Australia and other contributing countries uh, to sign up again for this task, which is in their interest as much as in the interest of the beneficiary countries. It's also possible to see new sources of finance being made available as we approach this replenishment phase. Uh, we at the moment can accept funding only from governments and I'm pleased to say that the ACT government is interested in providing a channel for others to, through them, uh, support the GCF. And we hope to finalise arrangements with them later this year. But there is also potential um, for crowdsourcing generally, for uh, philanthropic organisations. We've seen a lot of interest. I guess I have a phone call once a week with philanthropics from the US who are interested in contributing. So we have, um, we have an interesting prospect ahead of us. Uh, we, we have never done replenishment before and nobody's ever done this job before. So in the GCF, we have, uh, we have the fascinating task of pioneering some of those pathways that uh, I mentioned earlier are now truly imperatives for the developing world uh, and for the globe generally. Thank you very much. Plenty of food for question and answer in, in just a few minutes' time. And Howard, you will have to tell us whether the global uh, climate finance agenda is run by, by bankers and lawyers or, or engineers. Um, so, <laughs> so Australia is, of course, uh, engaged in, in climate finance and in the Green Climate Fund, not just uh, in terms of people helping, helping run the, the enterprise, but also in terms of financial contributions, um, and very much looking forward uh, to uh, remarks by Australia's uh, Ambassador for Environment, Patrick Suckling. No, thank you, Frank. And is this, um, is this Chatham House? Uh, no. No? OK. Good. Um, just to say first, thank you for the invitation and the Crawford School, but also Mark and the Climate Institute. We work very closely with both of you and uh, do good things together. And also to Howard, thank you very much. I should say when I started this job, maybe, Two and a half years ago or so, I was 
constantly set upon by countries around the world saying how hopeless the Green Climate Fund was. Um, its processes were cumbersome, it was complicated, it was time consuming and no one was seeing any money. And um, since that time, I think Australia with you and then Howard have worked very, very hard to turn that perception around. So now I'm constantly being beseeched um, as we all are now as donors for so much more money to replenish the Green Climate Fund because it's doing such a wonderful job. But it truly has moved as Howard showed very significantly over the last two and a half years. And if we do benchmark comparisons with new funds um, around the world over the last 20 years and the performance shown by the statistics up on the screen has been quite remarkable and that's increasingly recognised by a whole lot of um, countries and other other players. So uh, it, it's, it's something that is now associated with a strong Australian effort, which is a good thing from the Australian government's perspective. Uh, Howard traversed an enormous amount of ground, so I won't go through all of that again. Um, just to say that certainly from the Australian government's perspective, climate finance is very important um, for the reasons outlined. It's the People talk about the shifting of the trillions. The Paris Agreement genuinely is an agreement to transform the global economy to a low emissions, more climate resilient global economy. That means trillions of dollars, trillions and trillions of dollars will have to shift and how do you shift those dollars? So that's a, an agenda that internationally we're all working on. The Green Climate Fund is part of that, but as how we're saying, it's a part of it. There's many more things going on. And just to give you some brief sense of some of the things that we're focusing on, um, from an Australian perspective, the right signals to the private sector to invest in the transformation is very important, which is why we think the nationally determined contributions that Howard spoke about need to be genuine investment plans or business plans that the private sector can see the shift that's occurring in different economies and start investing in that transition. Uh, we think that our NDC provides that sort of signalling to Australian investors and then there's a whole panoply of um, policies and support systems in place in Australia, which I won't go into unless someone wants me to go through chapter and verse what all of our policies are in Australia to facilitate that shift. Uh, I could mention a, a couple in particular. One is ARENA, the Renewable Energy Agency, which is um, seeding um, and commercialising new ideas for cleaner energy and being very successful at doing that. And then we have this Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which is referred to in other countries as a green bank. I think it's the biggest green bank in the world, which is capitalised at $10 billion. It's got $4.5 odd billion committed so far, and it's leveraged about $16 billion worth of energy investments, cleaner energy investments in Australia. So in that sense, that's a tangible example domestically of how you shift. You start shifting enormous amounts of money required for transition and for transformation. <laughs> Um, the second part of all of that is, as Howard was saying, working with the private sector and others to develop the right um, financial instruments. So on the one hand, we create the policy, the enabling environments, the Paris Agreement and rules, regulations are an important part of that. Then we develop the instruments with the financial sector to support that stronger analytics around climate, stronger indices for investment, stronger disclosure regimes. I think BHP is now leading the world in terms of climate related disclosure. Um, and then working with the private sector on, for example, green bonds and how you get them to a state that are credible and people can ha have confidence that they're genuinely green. So that's a whole financial engineering task that we partner with um, business on and others as well. And, um, and then finally, how do you smartly leverage your public money? And I have, have heard a figure from the Green Climate Fund that says that of the amounts, I think you had 3.2 billion up there. There's some 1.8 billion that I've heard of that is leveraging $41 billion of private sector investment. If that's true, and these numbers have to be verifiable and they have to be consistent in terms of the way you account for climate finance, we've already hit our $100 billion goal because we did a, a review with the British in 2016 in terms of where were we up to with support provided and public public support was about $68 billion. So 41 billion plus 68 is over 100 billion. It's not that easy. So the way in which we're gonna to have to talk about how we meet the $100 billion target for 
developing countries is something we're working on um, with other countries as we speak. But, but how do you leverage private sector finance from public money is, is a very important part of the question. And that's something that Australia is well positioned to both through our aid program, but also through our, our very strong finance industry make a serious contribution to. So for example, Macquarie Bank has just bought the British Green Bank, which was the first green bank in the world. And what they're looking at is creating a whole business around green investing because they can see the future coming as was um, talked about by, by Howard. So that's, that's the whole um, shifting of the trillions <laughs> agenda. <laughs> um, uh, 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 a second part is support provided. The Paris Agreement, as Howard said, very strongly emphasises support to developing countries, developing countries that need support. Um, that's money, capacity building and technology. And Australia is playing our part in that, in that commitment as well. But increasingly what we're trying to get to as an international community is to say public money is a very important part of a much bigger picture. And so, for example, when we did lead this $100 billion roadmap in 2016, which we did with the British on behalf of developing countries working with the OECD to say, where are we up to in terms of the $100 billion story? Initially, a lot of developing countries were telling us exactly as Howard said, it, can, it only has to be public money. It has to be 100% public money to $100 billion. And we said it was never envisaged to be that. It's a lot of public money, but then it's other money as well. And it's public money, importantly, leveraging private sector capital. There's $100 billion sounds like a lot, but the IFC, the, the private sector bank of the World Bank, says that $23 trillion needs to be invested just in emerging markets, in big emerging markets, for them to meet their 2030 commitments. China's going to invest $7 trillion to meet their 2030 commitments, and the commitments go 2030, 40, 50, 60, 70. So you can see it's trillions and trillions of dollars. So $100 billion is a lot of money. It's very important, but it is the private sector ultimately that will need to drive um, through government policy settings, the significant transformation. I think over the year that we did that roadmap, we did manage, I think, to get a much stronger sense from developing countries, particularly very powerful ones, that private sector finance off the back of public finance has to be an important part of the story. So we'll continue to work that agenda. And then just finally, if I can mention how significant the finance elements are in the negotiations that we're currently prosecuting through the UNFCCC. So the job we have to do this year is to create what people call the rule book for the Paris Agreement, which is essentially to put the nuts and bolts into how does this agreement work and get it operational. And we have to finish development of those rules by the end of the year and developed, developing countries in some instances are saying, well, we can't make as much progress or we can't have as good a rules as we possibly should have unless we get more finance. So there's a big debate around how do we, how do we deal with that sort of very challenging dynamic in international negotiation because certainly our position is, is the rules for Paris will provide the mechanism for driving action and ambition for years and years to come. And every year we will have this discussion about finance and how much finance we have to provide. And developed countries are showing through the roadmap that we are stumping up what we committed we would um, and we don't want uh, the negotiations to be held hostage necessarily to a concept of more finance for completion of the rule book. The rule book's in everybody's interest to get done so the Paris Agreement can work so that we can drive forward in terms of action and ambition. I think I'll end it there. Thanks very much. <laughs>
uh, how do you go about that uh, in, in public finances of a donor country? And, and indeed, how does the Green Climate Fund uh, go, go about the relationship between aid and, uh, and climate finance? Uh, well, I'm, I'll make a start since my mic's on. Um, and Patrick will um, join in, I'm sure. I, I think... Um, it's inevitable that when countries provide funding externally, uh, they call it aid. Um, and there are a whole lot of reasons for that. Um, and, and I suppose the most obvious is that all developed countries have some sort of target for aid. Uh, and so they want every dollar that comes out of the, the budget uh, to be, to count towards that target. Uh, and you know, there are some unsavoury stories from different governments about how they extend that definition. But in relation to climate finance, it was supposed to be new and additional. So take your normal aid commitments and then add something new and add something additional. Uh, that's really difficult to demonstrate. I can say, hand on heart, that at least in the initial stages of this deal that was done in Copenhagen where the developed world was to pro provide $10 billion a year for three years, that Australia's contributions there were genuinely new and additional. That was because it was at a time of rising aid commitments under the Australian government at the time. That's, that, that's no longer the case. Uh, but it's, it becomes something of a theological argument. Uh, I think, in many cases, about whether that funding is new and additional. But that was, that was how it was intended to be. Patrick, any perspectives on the...? No, I, I don't need to have questions. <laughs> well, just two things. It is very complicated. We, we, are, um, we are questioned as to whether what we're doing is additional. And part of what we say is climate response is not an added optional luxury for an economy. It's an essential action that all economies need to take if they want to grow as best they can or develop as fast as they can. And therefore, this idea that there's this separate thing that's climate finance out here and development finance here, I think is increasingly being broken down because the sense is you have to integrate this concept. So for example, if we're building, as we do a lot in the South Pacific, a road or a school, we climate proof it. And it might cost 4% more to do that. So the majority of the investment is just building the road, and then you just do some analysis of withstanding whatever weather permutations over the next 20 or 40 years and 50 years, however long the life of the infrastructure is going to be. And that might be an additional element that you then embed into the overall cost. And so when countries come and say, oh, but you have to have an additional element, it's very high. it becomes very difficult because we're effectively mainstreaming climate action across the, all economies, including the Australian economy. So to try and disaggregate it in that way and say, oh, well, you need to have something that's a bit more than what you'd be doing as business as usual. Now you don't get it. Business as usual is incorporating the impacts of climate into your economic growth strategies or your development strategies. You can't just, it's not simply a matter of just adding something on. So that's one thing. The second thing is certainly from an Australian practitioner's perspective, this aid world is getting much more sophisticated. So we often now talk about, among ourselves, about needing to be investment bankers in the way we're approaching aid. And I think Howard's talk gave a very good example of why that's the case. And you wish to just give grant money. We often still do give grant money, but increasingly we're being asked to come up with a whole series of much more sophisticated financial instruments where you may have some element of public money and then try and leverage that or or use the public money to provide guarantees or first loss provisions to, the, to private sector money so that they'll invest. And in that sense, I think um, aid is becoming less programmatic in a way, program by program, and less grant-based in some senses, and much more highly financially engineered. And that is requiring new skills and ways of thinking and new partners to work with, including partners in the private sector have a lot more capabilities around this than we do. For example, Macquarie Bank, um, it, it, it's interesting, it'll be interesting to see what they do with this idea that they've had of buying the British Green Bank. Um, just to add one thought, which occurred to me while Patrick was speaking, um, in 
triggered by him that the to to make clear how complicated this notion is and new and additional, the French ODA agency, AFD, uh, have committed to making all of their funding, every last euro, consistent with the Paris Agreement. So in other words, you know, the whole package is now climate finance. Now, please do indicate to me if you want to ask a question so we can get the mic to you and Ken Baldwin is first. So Ken Baldwin, Director of the Energy Change Institute here at the ANU. So thanks, uh, Howard, for uh, enlightening us on the progress in the Green Climate Fund and uh, congratulations on the transformation that uh, Patrick mentioned over the last few years. Um, one of the things you mentioned early on was the transformational nature of what you're doing. It's not just the investment, it's really the transformational aspects. So one way of achieving transformation is to influence the lending policies of financial institutions. And my question is, what uh, role does that play in your uh, co-investment decisions and how proactive are you in, in, in requiring that financial institutions have a green or a carbon policy that aligns with the goals of the Green Climate Fund or, or, the, or the world generally? Yeah. It's a good question, Ken. Um, I think in we, we have partners I mentioned earlier. Uh, we call them accredited entities. They're organisations that we accredit in order for them to carry out our projects. So they extend from the World Bank right through to small uh, national financial institutions or other institutions uh, in developing countries, the whole gamut. And one of the explicit aims of the partnership agreements that we uh, settle with them before they're accredited is to change their, their funding practices so that they will move in the direction of uh, generally across their portfolios of more climate friendly activity. Uh, Howard Sabina work from the German Embassy. Um, I'd like to ask about the, you mentioned the country programs um, the Green Climate Fund is, is focusing on. Um, as with other big funds, um, like the Global Fund worldwide, is the Green Climate Fund providing for countries and their country programs in order to achieve climate readiness, climate project readiness, uh, some technical support um, in exploring their NDCs, in helping them um, with technical support to create fund, uh, projects and programs which are then ready for the fund to finance? Exactly, that's the idea of readiness. Uh, again, we don't. We provide the funding. They identify the need, the country's concern. What do we need to know? What institutions need to be strengthened? Uh, and can we do it ourselves, or do we need someone else to help us? And in many cases, they do need someone else. Often, they're international agencies such as UNDP or UNEP or GIZ, uh, and uh, those partners then provide the assistance required so that the the countries can get to a point where they can make real decisions about what they want to do next in terms of large projects. So the Vanuatu example that I mentioned where they started off actually using our front end uh, relatively limited support. It's not all that limited. It's a million dollars a year per country. So every country can claim up to every developing country can claim up to a million dollars a year for this readiness support. Uh, and they, that gave them a grip on the issue they were trying to deal with, gave them sufficient support to know how to specify the next big step they wanted to take and brought to us. And I th think that was 25 or $30 million for the next step. So yes, we do. And this is now, actually, I was a bit of a skeptic about this, to be honest. And I don't think we can guarantee that all countries are getting the highest value for their dollars at the moment. We're focusing this year on quality, on improving the quality of all of our, uh, all of our work, including readiness. But even so, what we're seeing 
uh, is a very substantial increase in the tempo of funding proposals coming to us. And we're very sure that part of that increase is due to the readiness, the early stage support that we and partners are providing countries to help them identify the big actions they want to take. This just wasn't happening anywhere else. And uh, lots of other agencies do provide some readiness support, but our emphasis on it, I think, is unique. And it's really beginning to pay off in terms of, of bringing more opportunities for contributors um, to, uh, to, to, to fund the next stage. We've got a question in the second row from the top, and then one just here. Yeah. Thank you. Jason Alexandra. A uh, question for Howard. Uh, the investment world works on uh, risk return ratios and risk premiums. Uh, have you or have you considered uh, having using mechanisms whereby uh, governments uh, underwrite projects with uh, the equivalent of a government bond rate uh, so that they basically take, they buy the risk, if you like, and make it a whole lot cheaper to borrow against the financing of that project? And then in the event that the project is successful, they don't have to, uh, as in it generates a higher return, they don't have to stump up anything. So they're basically using their credit, credit worthiness to finance innovative projects. Yes, that's, um, we, we don't do anything, I don't think we do anything precisely like that, but, but we could uh, if someone brought us a financial structure or it seemed appropriate in the circumstances. We do use our funds often to take first risk or highest risk to reduce the cost of capital then to everyone else in the game. So it has similar impact. Um, one of those projects, the, the energy efficiency project in Argentina that I didn't mention in detail is one of those, where we provide um, uh, an initial uh, component of a project for technical assistance, which just takes that cost out of the equation. That's the training, for example, in how industrial energy efficiency proceeds, you know, that sort of stuff. That uh, and, and then we'll provide um, a line of credit at, at a concessional rate uh, that will move things along and produce revenue um, uh, that might come back to us or might stay concessional depending on the structure. So we, we can do all sorts of contortions um, with uh, financial structures in order to meet the particular needs of, of that market. Uh, in India recently, we provided, I think it's $150 million uh, to Tata Capital, who were the only institution that were funding a rooftop PV in India. And the reason is not so much financial, I, I gather, but rather that nobody believed that the, the project developers would really do the job credibly. So, we can make some concessional financing to get that market um, gap uh, covered. Because India is doing so much else on, uh, on renewables that this was just a, a part of the market that wasn't covered. Edward Boydell, I'm a consultant. You touched on this briefly, um, but one thing that both the GCF and the Australian Aid Program have in common is the focus on gender and women's empowerment. So I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about the gender story uh, of the GCF, um, the commitments and um, frameworks that you use, and also how you're looking at the overall impact of the, um, of the fund uh, for women and girls. Uh, look, t trying to be very brief, um, uh, we've, we've worked with UN Women to produce a, a little uh, guide to how to establish, gen establish good gender policies in projects. We will be requiring project-specific gender um, plans. Uh, we have a number of different projects, uh, for example, where there is special emphasis that no one thought of until we got in the act on, um, on, on women's role. I mentioned the Acumen Fund in East Africa. In Mongolia, the Hus Bank, uh, which, we've, which is a really great partner for us, we've got several projects with them. 
One of them involves providing uh, debt funding to uh, small entrepreneurial groups or organisations uh, to provide uh, renewables to displace uh, biomass usually and, and coal uh, for heating and um, uh, in, in uh, communities. And they will lend to organisations led by women at a lower rate than to organisations led by men. And that can be justified commercially because the organisations run by women are more reliable. Uh, and in East Africa, there is a special, uh, uh, that, that the Acumen Fund again provides training for women to be, uh, provides funding for women to be trained as technicians and as salespeople in these new companies that are being established. Uh, again, they found that uh, women are more likely to stay in the community, not be attracted by the, the big lights of the big city, uh, and so provide a very stable base for, uh, for those sorts of activities. Just some examples of how we're trying to press the, 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 the margins all the time, uh, not just on the policy or, or the abstract, but actually in making our projects transform also for, uh, for women, the, their prospects. Hi, I'm just wondering, my name's Michelle Smith. Um, I'm just wondering whether, as a complementary policy, um, you would advocate a levy on fossil fuels, which would provide an incentive to change behaviour and would actually raise money rather than spending it? Um, it's, it's not as in... a complementary it's, policy? It's not in not in my mandate at present to to contemplate such a thing, but uh, uh, I can see the the point that you're you're making. I think a lot of investors would say that really the, the market's doing that now, um, and uh, so there's an interesting debate there. But it's not one that in my current role that I would I would be able to uh, take part in. I'm afraid. So I'll, I'll just briefly jump into, into the discussion here as well. And look, there's a fair bit of money on the table. And wherever there's a lot of money on the table, there will be a fair bit of competition um, for a greater share of that money. And so I was wondering, you know, I mean, ultimately, of course, this is a decision for the board of the Green Climate Fund, but are there any shared expectations as to what share of the fund might be allocated um, to one particular group of countries? or one region of the world, and how, how do you see these kinds of competing mm. um, interests and, and perhaps that competition play out if, if we see the Green Climate Fund as something that grows over time and thereby uh, grows in importance? That's a really big question for us because uh, there are different views about it and in the board. In the initial funding for the for the for the GCF, there was a provision to set priorities, essentially, um, and one of the priorities was for the poorest. Uh, that remains there, but uh, last year there was some debate about whether uh, there was, there should be a provision to change or at least to some sort of explicit provision about the level of concessionality uh, that would be provided in, uh, that would be available in funding provided to middle income countries. Uh, that became highly divisive in the board. Uh, the, the strong view of many developing countries was that there, for reasons associated with the foundation of the GCF in that equity deal, developed and developing, there could be no distinction made in GCF funding decisions about the income level of the country concerned. It was developing countries generally. And that same, um, I think, same sense um, has, whenever the issue of country caps, for example, has come up, has, uh, has, has made it, you know, very, has caused some developing countries to react very strongly. So I think, I think the uh, the result is that uh, the 
fund remains for the moment focused only on um, developing countries as a whole. And any attempt to uh, categorise the developing countries will certainly be met from some members of the board with uh, a very strong pushback. But can I just add, as a shareholder of the board, um, you know, it's a very political question. There's always argy-bargy about it. In our view, we wanted to see a strong flow of funds to South Pacific countries as some of the most vulnerable countries in, in the world um, in relation to climate change. And we did work very hard, including as the co-chair, to ensure that, A, there were readiness monies and support provided to Pacific Island countries to be able to tee up proposals, and then those proposals got considered. And I think, I'm not sure what the latest statistics are, Howard, you're probably better on this than me, but around 10% of the first um, $2 billion or so that was, was agreed on in the Green Climate Fund went to Pacific Island countries, which is a, an indication of how shareholders can be. And we were, we were by no means the only one, obviously, but, but, but can be influential in terms of pushing priorities that they have. Yeah, I think positive priorities have been have been features of the fund. So Africa, Ill, least developed countries and small island developing states. But restricting, restic restricting is another story. This will be our closing question, so we let you go on time. Uh, hi, I'm Christia. I'm a Master of Environmental student at ANU. I have a question also about how to prioritize different goals of adaptation action, especially there are different nature of those social impact, how should we say uh, these are the projects we should do them first? However, like there's a lot of ethical concern, especially when the funds are ended in CGF and then it will shift to private. The private sector always wants something. The project they want to uh, invest in will have some impact assessment. They maybe would choose some projects that have some obvious uh, investment in their adaptation funding and the outcome. However, many adaptation action it doesn't work like that. They don't have like a clear uh, assessment outcome in short term. How to balance this trade-off? Thanks. Oh, well, Patrick will have a view on this, I'm sure. Mine is it, that's up to governments. Governments set the frameworks for investment. Uh, they provide the incentives through different law. Uh, and they will have their own priorities. Uh, they can exclude private investment if they wish, but that's where the trillions are. And uh, so if you set a framework so that you encourage private investment to deal with the problems you want to, you, you would see as important, uh, then you'll get the sorts of results that you as a government want to see. The information, the analysis becomes really, really important to get science-based, evidence-based policy to say, well, it would be better if we focused on A rather than B. And the, the science and the data can play a very significant role in helping us get to that place or getting developing countries to that place. Well, it does appear to me like there's uh, grounds for optimism about the uh, implementation of, of climate change finance, and that in turn should have a, a positive signalling effect on the, on the climate change negotiations. The conversation will continue. Uh, please make sure that you're on, your, on our my, mailing list. You're obviously interested in these topics. Um, I'd like to say we very much appreciate your interest and the informed debate that we can have in forums like this. Uh, and please join me in thanking uh, our speakers. Thank you.